We'll start this morning with number 385. 385. Sing verses 1 and 4 before our scripture reading and prayer. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Let's pray. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful day. We thank you for the time that we have now to study from your word. Help us to understand the seriousness of this study. Help us to do our very best to pay attention to learn new things and make application in our lives so that we can be better examples, the best we can be for others who will be looking at us. Help us to have a positive influence today. Help us to have a positive influence as we leave this congregation, leave the study and leave this worship and go out into the world. Help us, God, to do our very best to lead others to you. Please continue to watch over us, God, and we also ask that you forgive us for our sins and help us to do our best to turn from those things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a beautiful Lord's Day we have to assemble together. We're thankful for everyone's presence this morning. It is time for our Bible study classes, and we're grateful for your attendance here, and especially any who are visiting with us today. Let's dismiss now to the nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. middle school, high school, and adults. I think I'm on. Oh, I definitely am. <laughs> 
Yeah, the new microphone is good. to the coat. I sort of hate to do that because if I get to looking at the PowerPoint then I turn away from my mic. But I feel like if I put it on my tie I'm just blowing everybody away. Okay, <clears throat> we talked last week uh, continuing this looking at, of course, uh, Bob has laid the foundation in the first six weeks, and of course we had a week off for the gospel meeting, uh, looking at the evidence for the existence of God, and of course I think we all realize that we just barely uh, scratched the surface of that, but uh, one of the things that I mentioned last week that he laid down that's very important is the fact that how, how we view that, uh, whether God is or, or there is not a God, it, it really affects our entire worldview. It affects how we view the world, period. But we've been looking in, in this six weeks of study thus far at evidence that the Bible is what it claims to be, not necessarily looking at evidence for inspiration, but looking at uh, what is called higher criticism, looking at, well, did Matthew write the book of Matthew? Did Isaiah write the book of Isaiah? And, of course, again, we've just barely, <clears throat> we've kind of just barely touched the hem of the garment, but I think it's enough to give us an idea of I didn't really finish my material last week. I don't want to just continue where I left off because I want to get into the uh, study today of Jesus. But I, I just want to mention a, a couple of things because, <clears throat> in fact, I was, I was almost decided I cooled off toward the end of the week. I about decided I was going to come and do more on New Testament criticism uh, because I got so frustrated when I read an article, uh, or I think it might have even been an interview. No, it was an article of a fellow that he's kind of a leading textual critic. And, you know, I don't claim to be an expert. Y'all know I don't, I don't claim to be a highly educated person, sophisticated, or anything of that sort. But I've got common sense. And I read this article, and I got to thinking, maybe this fellow ought to stick with textual criticism and stay away from this higher criticism stuff, because he left himself, and apparently he didn't even see it. But uh, Foster, R.C. Foster, I don't have it with me today, but the big, thick book that I brought yesterday, it's in our library. The book is called Life of Christ. <clears throat> and the reason it's so huge is it's really like, it, it may be four. I know it's at least three books combined. He originally published those. Apparently, he taught a class for years. Uh, I'm not sure where it was, but uh, he taught this class for years, and he, I think his son compiled his dad's notes and then published it in a, in a book, or, or maybe the dad put it all together. But um, Foster points out the dilemma that even these conservatives find themselves in because this fellow, uh, Daniel B. Wallace is his name. I don't know if anybody recognizes that name or not, but he's, uh, he's done a lot of good work in the field of textual criticism and helping people uh, to understand how we got the Bible and how well attested the Bible is. It's not just a book that, you know, sometimes people say, well, how do we even know that the Bible has been faithfully translated? Well, you know, those are questions that nobody asks about the Roman historian Tacitus, his works, and there are literally thousands more manuscripts as evidence for, ta uh, for the Bible than there are for, like, Tacitus and other uh, ancient works. But this fellow was writing his article, and <clears throat> he was talking about how it's, it seems that Mark was the... Hey, Brandon. Hey, dude. Didn't know y'all were here. Um, it seems that... Uh, snuck in on me there. Uh, it seems that, you know, he says, it seems that Mark is the one that would be the, the, the kind of the priority that, that Luke and Matthew seem to have copied from. John's just different altogether. And, you know, it, it, it frustrated me really very much. And I was talking to Bob about it last, last Sunday evening. But, but here's the dilemma that these fellows find themselves in. He admits in the article that Matthew wrote the book of Matthew. Okay, what was Matthew? <clears throat> y'all, y'all, again, y'all know I'm I'm all about common sense. Matthew was a tax collector turned, yeah, apostle. Y'all thought I was asking a trick question or something, didn't you? <laughs> he was an apostle. Who did he spend three, some three, three and a half years with? Jesus. He was there 
when Jesus walked on the water. He was there when Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Okay. So Matthew sits down and decides he's going to write a gospel account. And he says, Whew, you know, I want to make sure I get this right. So I'm going to check with Mark, who wasn't there. Think about that, folks. That's the, that's the dilemma these fellows take on when they say, oh, yeah, see, the conservatives will admit Matthew wrote the book. But then they say, well, yeah, he wrote the book, but he, he leaned on Mark because it seems Mark was written earlier. So he leaned on Mark and used him as a source. You know, if I'm an eyewitness to something, I'm not going to go to someone who's not an eyewitness to find out what happened and make sure I get it right. That's just common sense, folks. Of course, the liberals get themselves in another dilemma altogether because they try to deny that Matthew wrote the book of Matthew and that Mark wrote the book, you know, and they, they get into a whole other dilemma that's <clears throat> really a lot easier to answer because archaeology. The Bible's best friend is archaeology. and You've heard me say that a lot, but it's true. But before we move into this study on Jesus, uh, I wanted to read you this quote from Irenaeus, or Irenaeus, I'm not really sure how to pronounce that. But uh, this man lived somewhere around A.D. 135 and died somewhere around A.D. 200. But he saw Polycarp in his youth. And if you know church history, Polycarp was a disciple of whom? John. John the Apostle. So you got a man who's about a generation removed from an apostle, but he also was instructed in his youth uh, by those who were associated with the apostles. But, but here's what he says, uh, he wrote, <clears throat> Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect. Now, if we had more time, we'd go into that. It appears that uh, all the evidence points toward Matthew wrote his gospel account originally in the Hebrew dialect, which would technically be what we would call Aramaic. By then, all the Hebrews spoke Aramaic. It wasn't like a, the old school uh, Hebrew. But uh, so this Aramaic, and then, of course, later he translates it into Greek. Um, possibly someone else translated it into Greek, but it seems that Matthew did that. But anyways, he said he wrote, issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome and laying the foundations of the church. After their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. Remember we talked about that before, Mark probably writing with uh, Peter, helping him out with some eyewitness accounts. And, of course, you know, they're all writing by inspiration. And I said that last week. We've, we've purposely not talked a lot about inspirations factor in this just to meet the liberal critics on their ground, so to speak, and answer these things from a common sense perspective. And, of course, when you put in there that God says, the Bible says, they were moved, born along by the Spirit. You know, that, that, that nails it shut. <clears throat> but he goes on and says, uh, Luke also, the companion of Paul, recorded in a book, the gospel, uh, it's hard to read my own writing here, the gospel preached by him afterwards. Uh, the gospel preached by him. Then afterwards, John pr published a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. So, Here's a guy who's writing at the latest, if he wrote just before his death, it's somewhere around 200. And he says, Matthew wrote in the Hebrew dialect, Aramaic. And then, of course, as the gospel takes on this worldwide scope, you know, the gospel, what did Jesus say? It's the word of the Lord goes forth from Jerusalem, right? That was the prophecy, Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. Um, so it started in, right there in Jerusalem. So there, at, in the beginning, there's just you got these Hebrews who typically are going to speak Aramaic. Some speak uh, some Greek. But they're definitely all going to speak this Aramaic language. So Matthew writes in that language. Well, as it begins to take on a wider scope, then you have Mark writing. Then you have Luke. And, of course, Luke has a distinctly uh, Gentile flavor to it, if you will. In other words, there are a lot of instances recorded in the book of Luke that aren't recorded in the other gospel accounts of Jesus' interaction and helping and praise of Gentiles. In fact, one of the best remembered stories, parables from the book of Luke, is a parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 10 about a good Samaritan. Well, that was not a Jew. In fact, very much hated by the Jews. But, <clears throat> you know, again, Jew, Luke himself being a Gentile, but he's showing the gospel is for all, written primarily to the Gentiles. 
Uh, and of course, John coming along later. So much unique material in John. Six out of the eight miracles are unique to the book of John. John spends zero time on the birth, early life of Jesus. Why? Because it's already been covered. And, and so that's what another thing that so, so many of these higher critics seem to refuse to take into account is that there's a reason for the differences in the accounts. There's a reason for the similarities. About, oh, I had a percentage in here of how much of the Gospels are dealing with the last week of Jesus' life. About half. About half of the Gospel accounts are devoted to the last week of Jesus' life, especially, of course, his trial, death, burial, and resurrection. So imagine that. There's going to be some similar material. There, there are going to be similar circumstances that appeal to everyone, that everybody's going to hone in on. And, of course, the, the gospel being the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, they're all going to, all four are going to spend a lot of time on that. And they do. In fact, John spends a tremendous amount of time on that last week of Jesus' life. But, uh, you know, as I said last week, I just mainly wanted to bring out a couple of those points and then emphasize that, uh, what we said last week, you will never... You will nowhere in all of literature find three books, and really we could throw John in there as well and say four, but especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Three books that are so much alike and yet so different. And, and that's it's one of those evidences for inspiration. There are certain things about the book, the Bible, and, and this is one of those instances there, that you can't answer it from a purely human standpoint. I mean, even the copying, when you come to Luke, even if we were to say, okay, you know, I think I'm leaning toward Luke copied from Mark or, or maybe from Matthew. But you know what Luke omits? He doesn't even, he doesn't even cover, in fact, it's, it's several, uh, several events. that he, the, the narrative that's in Matthew and Mark of the events that go from the feeding of 5,000, feeding of the 5,000 to Peter's uh, confession of Jesus at Caesarea Philippi. Why would you leave out Jesus walking on the water? I mean, if you're copying, you know, when, when we copy something or we're, or we're using a resource, even if we're not just outright plagiarizing, if we're using a resource and we come across something that big and that, that stands out like that, we say, well, I'm going to include that in my paper because that's important. I mean, a man walking on water, pretty important, right? Why would Luke leave that out if he's copying? There's no reason why except he had something, some kind of reason, inspiration, for leaving that out. You cannot answer the similarities and the differences in these books without attributing it to something beyond human means. Same as the prophecies in the Old Testament. You cannot answer that from a purely human standpoint. And that's why there's this desperate attempt by the higher critics to late date these books. And so you, you know, now you're not having, dealing with prophecy, you're just dealing with current events. But it doesn't hold up. Archaeology, time and again, shows these books were written. That's what we talked about last week. The higher critics want to take the New Testament books, late date them. But archaeology keeps turning up manuscripts, keeps turning up evidence that shows, you know what? They were written very early. Luke had to be written by 60-ish A.D. Because the book of Acts ends with Paul in prison, and that's around 61 or 62. And it's a continuation from the book of Luke. So Luke was written earlier, so it had to be, I think most people say, most conservative scholars say 58 to 60. But there are these common sense things that we have to realize. If we acknowledge Matthew wrote the book that's, that has his name attached to it, then what on earth need would an eyewitness have for consulting sources? And that's what this, this fellow, Mr. Wallace, who is, I, I've read some of his stuff. In fact, when we were going through the How We Got the Bible Study, I read several of his articles and just... Uh, really learned a lot from him in that area. And then I read this, this article on uh, the Synoptic Gospels and just, sh just shake my head because he can be so foolish and not even see that dilemma that he puts himself in. Uh, Brother Hamilton, have you got a... or No, Adam, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hamilton's going, don't ask me. Uh, you got a PowerPoint back there? It, it'll say, Jesus, Savior, or Fraud. Let's, let's take a look at this. We won't get through this today. Um, <clears throat> let me give you uh, two things. Let me give you a little background. But first, let me say this. This PowerPoint is not mine, and you'll see that when you, when you get uh, 
when I get to going with this PowerPoint. You'll, you'll be able to tell that it's not like most of my PowerPoints that I do. But I figured, why well, reinvent the wheel? This is a good PowerPoint, so I'm going to use it. Here's what happened, and I, I've told you a little bit of this, but uh, this was back, I don't know, 2007, 2008. Uh, this fellow that played on a team with me in Chattanooga, we were, something came up about having a Wednesday night makeup game. We'd had a rained out game, and uh, I told him I wouldn't be there because I was going to be at Bible study, and uh, he, you know, he was our team captain, and he was very understanding about it, very super nice guy. And so he had the team's email address. So somewhere along the way, he emailed me. And he says, uh, so you're into Bible study, is the way he put it. And uh, he says, I like, uh, I like study or something like that. He says, but I've, I've searched around, and I can't remember his exact word. But basically, he was saying I'm not really impressed with the Bible. And I said, well, you know, why, why is that? I, I, I like to consider myself uh, an open-minded person, and uh, so I'd like to... I'd like to know why. Well, one of the things that he said, he had, he had a few things that <clears throat> were really um, not, not substantial, uh, supposed discrepancies at all. But the real thing he honed in on that started our discussion was Jesus. He said, he said look, man, these, these, uh, Jesus is, you know, and I'm paraphrasing for what he was saying, but what he was essentially saying is, look, Jesus is a Johnny-come-lately. These savior gods, as he termed it, have been around forever. And Jesus is just the next in a long list. And I said, uh, I, don't, I don't think you're right about that. You know, can, you, can you provide some evidence for that? Well, he did. He started tell, telling me some names. Krishna, Osiris, Dionysus. And so I started doing a little bit of uh, quick research on the web. Well, sure enough, these were turning up and... Uh, I thought, boy, you know, I, I don't, this, this doesn't seem to hold up, but, uh, you know, again, I'm, I want to be an honest person, and so I'm going to study this through. So I didn't really know where to start, so I emailed uh, Eric Lyons from Apologetics Press, and I said, Eric, I know you're busy, but quite honestly, I've never heard of this before. I was, um, what is this, 2013, so y'all know I'm not very good with math, but uh, somewhere around six or seven years ago, so I was about... 30, 29 years old maybe, all my life. I'd never heard this before. Well, Eric sends me an email, and he says a few things in email, but he says basically this PowerPoint deals with most of what you're talking about. And so that's what we're going to be looking at here and, and ask the question, and that's the, the basic gist of the PowerPoint presentation, is asking, is Jesus the unique savior of the world, or is he just an average fraud? And that's what the skeptics say. Well, he's just, just another average old fraud. But the Bible says clearly that he's the unique savior of the world. But here's, here's where this, this will go. And again, we won't come close to finishing all this today, but I want to get it started and try to at least get through two or three of these points. Um, who are the other savior gods? We'll ask that question and answer it. Who, who are these other um, so-called savior gods that this fellow and other folks talk about? We'll look at some Savior similarities. That'll make more sense when we get to it. We'll note the fact that God did not forsake the non-Jewish nations. We make that mistake sometimes when we come to the Bible, myself included. And sometimes I'm reading somebody that brings this point out, and it's like, oh yeah. Uh, we forget about that sometimes, because the Bible focuses in so much on Israel. And, and of course, there's a reason for that. The reason being, they are the womb in which the Savior is being nurtured, so to speak, and eventually will be brought forth into the world through the nation of Israel. It's not because they're better than everybody else. And, and in fact, that's what many of the Jewish folks began to think, unfortunately. Paul argues very strongly in the book of Romans, God doesn't owe you anything, Israel. If you want to be saved, you're going to be saved just the same way every Gentile is going to be saved. Obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why he says in the beginning of the book, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now that Jew first is not priority, that's just the order. It went to the Jews first and then to the Greeks. But um, God didn't forsake the, Jew, the non-Jewish nations. Why the perfect sacrifice? We'll answer that question. Why a resurrection? What makes Jesus different? You know, okay, if you say, the, you know, there, there are all these other Savior gods. Well, what makes Jesus so special among this group? 
And then, of course, the question, you've probably heard this used before, Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or Lord. We've got to make that choice as to which. All right, let's look at the other Savior gods. There's Osiris. I think I mentioned that one a while ago. Osiris is this mythological god who's, little g god, of course, whose story is recorded in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. But here's the thing, 1400 B.C. And that's one of the things that uh, my friend Almir pointed out to me. He said, look, that's 1400 years before Jesus was even born. Called King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Uh, after he was put to death, he allegedly rose from the dead and wore the name the Resurrected One. Um, his scribe, Ani, described as one whose word is truth. Then you've got Dionysus, if I'm pronouncing that right. This is, of course, you, if you know much about Greek mythology, there's Zeus, who's kind of the chief god. But he's the son of Zeus and a mortal woman named Samel or Sameli. Um, supposedly, he descended into the Hadean realm, conquered death, and then brings his dead mother back to the land of the living. I'll tell you, as a child, uh, I, and this, this goes kind of with the big picture of this study on Jesus, as a child, I loved Greek mythology. Uh, I really got into that, and one of the things that made Greek mythology so fascinating, uh, especially, I guess, to a child, is to see people like Dionysus, I don't remember him in particular, um, but people who could sort of cheat death. That, that, for some reason, for all humanity, and it's because death is such a feared enemy. And you'll see when we talk about that, how that comes into play with this study. But even children, adults, all of us, there's something about a, a, uh, a character that we can really latch on to because, boy, he defeated death. And that's, that's something big for all of us. Then, um, let's see, he's said to have died and been raised again. Followers call him Redeemer and use grape juice to symbolize his blood. His story goes back to about 500 B.C., at least. Then you've got Krishna. This is the Hindu god, portrayed sometimes as hanging on a cross with holes through his hands and feet, called Lord and Savior, supposedly rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. This story dates back somewhere around 1200 B.C., I want you to read a quote here from a man named Farrell Till. Farrell Till was a, a, really a sad story. He went into a mission field. I want to say France. He went to a very difficult mission field. Uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know the man. I don't know the reasons why, but he failed utterly in this mission field. I mean, it, it just never really uh, got going or never, never took off or whatever. But what happened was he just suddenly decided it was God's fault, apparently, and began to react very strongly against God and the Bible. And I don't even know if he's still alive, but he was, he was a little bit older a few years ago. Does anybody know? Has anybody you heard anything? I haven't heard anything from him in years. But he became one of the most militant anti-Bible, anti-Jesus, anti-Christian, anti-anything spiritual people that you can imagine. This man was a member of the body of Christ and he just turned his back on it and he, I mean, militantly attacking Christianity. And so uh, he actually had a debate with, I believe it was Norman Geisler. Uh, it's on the slide here in just a minute. Yeah, Norman L. Geisler uh, at Columbus College. This was in March of 1994. But here's a statement that Farrell Till made in that. Now, when I was in college, uh, Farrell was sending emails if he could get college students' addresses. I had a lot of friends at Faulkner. I never went to Faulkner, but I had a lot of friends who did. Um, Hamilton, any of y'all ever get anything from Farrell Till? If he could get his hands on a Faulkner student or anybody, really, their email address, he would send you this packet. It was a compressed, zipped file, and when you unzipped it, it was just loaded with material. In fact, I still have a copy of it. Somebody sent it to me. Uh, might have been Jason Chesser that sent it to me, and, and I, I looked at it, and it's just filled with things, you know. Here, how are you going to answer this, Christians? Failed land promise from 
Yahweh and um, you know, here's this failed promise, here's this failed prophecy, and he has all these accusations just trying to destroy people's faith. But here's a statement that he made in that debate. Crucified, resurrected Savior gods who had been born of virgins were a dime a dozen by the time Jesus was born. That's his uh, statement regarding Jesus. In other words, basically like my friend Almir said, hey, a Johnny come lately. So that's the question that we're dealing with. There was a, there was a 2000 article in Newsweek, Don Zomberg wrote of, of Wyoming, Michigan. He wrote to the uh, editor, Kenneth Woodward wrote the actual article, and part of his statement or, or letter to the editor says, the legend of Jesus, notice he says the legend of Jesus, is little more than a variant of older religious religions common to the Middle East thousands of years ago. Here's the point. None of these parallels are exact, but they are close enough to demand some scrutiny, to demand that we investigate this if we're going to say we believe in Jesus as the Son of God. I don't, I don't operate on blind faith. Bible faith is not blind faith. It's not just shaking your head and say, look, you know, I told him I was raised by Christian parents and I'm going to be Christian and I'm going to believe in God the rest of my life. You know, that's not, and that's what the whole point of all this course of study is with, with Bob doing um, the earlier six weeks and then now this six weeks of study. That's the whole point of this is because that's not Bible faith. It's not just I'm going to leap out into darkness and hope God is there. It's about knowing what we believe, why we believe it, and knowing the evidence for it. So that's why we're going to look into this. Yeah, there are a lot of discrepancies, and you probably already saw that looking at some of these so-called Savior gods. There are a lot of very strong differences, but there are some similarities that make us go, okay, you know, did someone take some of these and put together certain details and invent this story of Jesus, or, or what? So that's why we're looking into this. Understand also, the skeptics' allegations, they're not new. If anybody is a Johnny-come-lately, it's the people who make these accusations. You know, Farrell Till, he thought he was so novel and really had come up with these uh, undefeatable arguments against God's existence and against the inspiration of the Bible and the accuracy of the Bible. And, you know, people are sitting here saying, look, these have been dealt with by Christian apologists literally for hundreds and a couple of thousand of years. People have been attacking, and that's one of the evidences, by the way, of the inspiration of the Bible and the fact that it's a different book. It has been unassailable. I won't say unassailable. People have tried. But it has been undefeatable for so many years. Yeah, there, there's sometimes, sometimes we investigate a problem or a supposed contradiction and we find out it's a translation error or a copyist error, somebody who was copying the scriptures. But the Bible itself has been vindicated time and time again as being right and from God. But understand, the early Christian apologists dealt with a lot of these different arguments. Um, here's the interesting point. They even emphasized these similarities in order to get pagans to understand more about Jesus and exactly what his mission was. They would also note that the stories of Christ were much more certain because they were documented with historical evidence. These skeptics would make basically two points, or not skeptics, the apologists, would basically make two points. One being that men of the past had searched for a unique Savior God, and not finding one, they resorted to inventing him and bestowing upon him certain distinct characteristics. And that's why you'll see a lot of things common. The main thing you see common to all of these is they all rose from the dead. you got to have somebody who can conquer death, right? I mean, that's got to be your Savior because we all die. From the least to the greatest, we all die. And then, of course, number two, that Savior, who although in the past... Uh, had been endowed with unique traits of their own feeble creation, actually had come. That's what the apologists are saying. They're saying, look, people in the past had searched for a Savior, and they didn't find one. And, and some of them grew so impatient that they resorted to inventing these myths and beginning to tell them, or, or maybe they'd corrupted a prophecy, as we'll see later on. And So they began telling that. But then, then the apologists would bring out the point and say, look, 
here is historical, verifiable, documented evidence that he has come. God has come down among us. He died on the cross. He rose again. And now we have hope beyond this life. So they didn't shy away from this save these savior similarities, if you want to call it that. They didn't shy away from that. In fact, they embraced it and said, look, it's evidence that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And so what response can be offered to the critics' charges? What assurance can be offered to those who believe in Jesus? Notice also that the issue is not the historicity of Jesus. Infidels have long acknowledged that a man named Jesus walked this earth. He was a great teacher. He had a great number of followers. And, of course, he was crucified just outside of Jerusalem right around the time of the Passover, somewhere 30, 33 A.D. People have acknowledged that for years. But the question is, is he who he claimed to be? The unique, only begotten, incarnate God in the flesh. Is he the Son of God? Is he the Savior of the world? That's the question that we're dealing with. Notice, uh, let's talk a little bit about Savior similarities. It shouldn't be a big surprise to us that we find similar stories to Jesus uh, because here's one reason. Ever since Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all of humanity has been very keenly aware of the presence of sin and, of course, the consequences of sin. The wages of sin is death. And, of course, that's, you know, death over and over again plays a part here because that is mankind's common enemy. Rich, poor, young, old, that's our common enemy that we have to uh, worry about all the time. And we know that at some point, if the Lord doesn't return, we're going to die. From the time of Cain and Abel, God had established sacrifices and he had specific rules regarding those sacrifices. Not only that, since the beginning of sacrifice, mankind has had some kind of perception, sometimes it may be pretty flawed, but some kind of perception that they needed to do something to stand justified once again before their creator. Not, you know, again, people sometimes get off into this about a debate of work salvation versus grace salvation. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about obeying God, that there's something that God requires of people. Not to earn salvation, but just to obey him and be justified right in his sight. One way to do this was to invent, if you want to use the term, a stand-in. Someone who could take my place as the perfect sacrifice. Take your place as the perfect sacrifice. The epitome of sinless perfection to plead our case before the righteous judge of all the world. Of course, Genesis 18.25 says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? It should also be noted that the similarities that we noticed, well, they're just that. They're similarities. You know, you might take two, two objects or two people and talk about similarities, but for every similarity there might be a million differences. And that's the way it is sometimes with evolution. Evolutionists grasp onto a similarity here and there, but they ignore all the differences. They'll say, look, the wing of a bat is so similar. The bones and the wing of a bat are very similar to those of a bird or, or something. I don't know what, what they compare it to. I haven't looked at that in a long time, but there actually is a comparison that is made, and sometimes still in textbooks, of the wing of a bat and the bone structure to another animal. But what they ignore is the mountain of differences in those critters. So, you know, they're, the similarities, they're, they're just that. They're similarities Quite a number of discrepancies, quite a number of differences, but the similarities are close enough to demand scrutiny and an explanation. I will tell you this, and we'll get to this in just, uh, uh, just a little bit. I don't know if this is today or different, going to be a different part of the lesson, but uh, one of the main things to realize, and this is what I pointed out to Almir when we were having this discussion, is show me evidence of Krishna walking the earth. Show me evidence of Osiris on this earth, Dionysus. You remember we said he was son of the Greek mythological god, Zeus? Mythological? There's a reason why we call all of that that I mentioned before Greek mythology. Because they didn't exist. 
Show me evidence of them walking the earth, being real people. And yet, we can go and look at thousands upon thousands of documentations that a man named Jesus was born on this earth, that he walked this earth, that he dwelt among us, that he died on a cross at the hands of the Roman authorities at the behest and request of the Jewish people. Jesus' story is real. It's historical. It's historically verifiable. None of these other Savior gods is. Uh, let's try to get through this very quickly. God did not forsake the non-Jewish nations. Um, the prophets of Israel foretold the coming of a unique, heaven-sent, virgin-born, miracle-working, sacrificial, resurrected from the dead Savior. It, that being the case, then it's logical to conclude that God would also have revealed that message to the Gentiles. Again, he did not forsake non-Jewish nations. Notice just a few prophets, non-Jewish prophets. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, he walked with God 300 years and he prophesied, according to Jude 14. We, we talked about him last week looking at epitaphs. He walked with God, but he also prophesied. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, according to 2 Peter 2, 5. You got Melchizedek, the king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. He wasn't a Jew. God spoke directly to Job, the patriarch, Job 38 to 41. God appeared to a soothsayer from Mesopotamia, whose name was Balaam, instructing him not to go help the Moabites. You've got Rahab, the Canaanite. She heard about the great works of God, believed in him. Asked for God's mercy and received it in the conquest of Jericho. What about the wise men from the east? They knew about the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. They even received direction from God himself. Wise men from the east, these weren't Jews. Another few well-known prophets, Obadiah, he prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem. Now these were Jews, but they were dealing with Gentiles showing that God's not just ignoring non-Jews. You've got Jonah, he prophesied to uh, the Assyrians in Nineveh. Then you've got Nahum, he prophesied Assyria's doom about 100 years or so after Jonah. Amos and Ezekiel delivered judgments to the Ammonites, Phoenicians, Egyptians, and Edomites, all dealing with heathen nations. Sometimes we ask the question, well, where would stories of Savior gods have originated? Look at this passage in Luke 11, Jesus speaking here, but notice about midway or so right here, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zacharias. Well, Abel, Abel wasn't a prophet, right? Wasn't a Jewish prophet, but he was a prophet. He was a prophet of God, and we already noticed that earlier. That's Luke 11, 49 to 51. Here's another passage. Acts 3, 19 to 21, where he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, really better translated repent and turn, that your sins may be blotted out. And going down to the end of the verse, till the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. We would be foolish to think that the only prophets God's ever had are Jewish prophets. He has had prophets since the world began. In fact, in the New Testament, you may remember when we first started our study of the minor prophets on Wednesday nights, that we noted that there were prophets in the New Testament times as well, many of whom were not Jewish, of course, because God's breaking, broken down that distinction. There's just Christians. So prophets since the world began. Here's another one, Luke 1, through 70. Zacharias is filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, uh, going down, he's raised up a, a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he has spoken by the mouth of his prophets, which have been since the world began. I hope we see that God has had prophets doing their work, his work, as long as time has been here. Genesis 3.15, the first prophecy. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, the serpent and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. God told Abraham, in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Genesis 22.18. Genesis 12, 3 is really the beginning of that prophecy. But he, he told Abraham that it would be in Abraham's seed that all families, not just one specific family, but all families of the earth would be blessed. 
So here's the thing. We'll, we'll stop with this and talk next week about why does it have to be the perfect sacrifice and, and some of the similarities there. God's scheme of redemption through a hero who's going to save the world from sin. He's going to save the world from, from death. But that scheme of redemption was being revealed constantly ever since the fall of mankind in the garden. It was being revealed to the Jewish people as we read about it in the Old Testament. But don't think for a second it wasn't being revealed also to the Gentile nations. Many times they corrupted it. And you'll see Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 1, corrupting God and his revelation, especially uh, taking and beginning to worship the creature more than the uh, creator, the creation in other words. But God was revealing his will to Gentile nations as well. Wasn't he just had nothing to do with them? So let's don't fall into that mistake. All right, next week we'll talk about, we'll pick up with why the perfect sacrifice, why resurrection, and then we'll get to really the meat of this study, which is what makes Jesus different? Why is he so special, or is he special? Of course, we're going to take the position that he is, and you'll see the evidence for that position. Thank you very much. We'll have a break before worship.